Democrats and Democrats to the premises of the European Union that I'm sure most of you know before. Um, because we had the opportunity in the past and now to thank you for your efforts, thank you for your activism, thank you for being uh, aware of what's happened in the whole world uh, regarding human rights and to be in contact uh, with us. Let's start our program uh, immediately. I'm giving the floor to Maria Nena. She is the chair, as you know, of this Committee of Human Rights in the European and Parliament, one of the persons that is a beacon, like Manfred uh, Novak, who is uh, <laughs> being with us later uh, in the human rights defense all over the world on behalf of the European Parliament. Maria, please. Muchas gracias, Nacho. I don't know if I can speak in French. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah? yeah? So. Okay. Yeah. I will do it in French if it's, uh, if it's okay for you, so put your headset. Um, alors, mais merci beaucoup tout d'abord uh, pour l'organisation de, de la conférence et je veux vraiment remercier uh, Nacho qui a uh, vraiment uh, été uh, l'artisan uh, de l'organisation de cette conférence et uh, Carlo, bien sûr, uh, mais ils sont inséparables, hein, donc uh, quand je dis merci à Nacho, je dis merci à Carlo, uh, mais uh, pour uh, effectivement avoir uh, mené à bien uh, cette rencontre et aussi à toute l'équipe, bien entendu, du groupe socialiste et démocrate. Alors on le sait, cette conférence est un peu un point de départ, c'est-à-dire que l'objectif est, c'est vraiment pour moi, et je pense euh, en tant que président de la Commission des droits de l'homme, c'est important, c'est une opportunité d'échanger euh, sur la cohérence qui me tient particulièrement à cœur et l'efficacité des politiques de l'Union européenne en matière de droits de l'homme, ainsi que sur le rôle du, du Parlement européen dans les réorientations et la mise en œuvre de son approche en matière de droits humains dans un contexte de politique extérieure, je dois dire, un peu euh, confus aujourd'hui, euh, dû bien entendu à la guerre en Ukraine, mais cette guerre en Ukraine a sans doute mis en évidence un certain nombre de choses, mais ce sont des choses qui préexistaient et qui demandent bien entendu de notre part une euh, analyse et un, un débat qui nous permet euh, de continuer à nous projeter dans cette question des droits de l'homme. Alors on veut que ces journées soient une journée de réflexion, comme je le disais, sur la manière dont les droits de l'homme peuvent être abordés de manière transversale à travers toutes nos politiques et tous les accords, qu'ils soient commerciaux ou autres. On a souvent l'habitude de travailler en silo, euh, mais les droits de l'homme, c'est tout. Euh, C'est-à-dire que, que l'on parle de la question environnementale, les droits de l'homme sont présents, que l'on parle de la question commerciale, les droits de l'homme sont présents, que l'on parle de l'accès aux ressources, on a des directives sur la question des batteries, sur la question de la gestion des déchets, la question des droits de l'homme est dedans. Et donc, travailler en silo et ne pas avoir cette approche transversale serait une erreur. Alors, on le voit, la conférence aujourd'hui va être organisée en deux panels. Un premier panel qui nous donnera l'occasion d'aborder la manière dont l'Union européenne traite les droits de l'homme et les outils dont elle dispose. Hier, Beaucoup d'outils, j'allais dire pléthore d'outils, non. Il y a beaucoup euh, d'outils sur lesquels on peut euh, s'appuyer. Mais on va peut-être aussi se rendre compte dans le deuxième panel, dans l'application, dans l'efficacité d'un certain nombre d'outils, euh, voir que parfois, euh, on n'a pas toujours euh, l'application telle qu'on la souhaiterait. Et donc, c'est peut-être aussi comprendre ce qui, dans cette application, est difficile, euh, est parfois contradictoire et pourrait être euh, complété par euh, de nouveaux outils. Alors, effectivement, on a beaucoup d'outils et moi, je me réjouis de voir qu'il y a de nouveaux outils qui arrivent aussi et pour lesquels on doit euh, travailler sur leur configuration pour qu'ils ne fassent pas pire que mieux. Euh, je prends euh, l'exemple de la directive sur la « due diligence euh, ». On sait que notre collègue Lara Volters fait un travail remarquable dans la commission jury sur la discussion sur le, la, la responsabilité des entreprises. Ben, il faut quand même avoir en tête que l'objectif de cette directive telle qu'elle a été posée par la commission européenne sur la table, ce n'est pas tout à fait l'objectif du groupe socialiste et démocrate. Euh, et donc il va y avoir un travail qui est un travail important pour rendre cette directive compatible avec nos euh, demandes. Et j'ai un peu l'impression de revivre euh, un film du passé. C'est exactement le même mécanisme qu'on a vécu dans les minerais des conflits. Euh, 
C'est-à-dire ce que la Commission nous a mis sur la table n'était absolument pas ce qu'on voulait. Et puis il a fallu, comme les saumons qui remontent le courant, il a fallu récupérer un certain nombre de choses. C'est un peu ce qui se passe avec la due diligence aujourd'hui. On va avoir le même travail sur le travail forcé, qui est aussi une proposition qui, viendra, qui va venir et qui va demander... Une, une correction de, de, de ce qui nous est mis sur la table. On a le travail sur le GSP+, c'est-à-dire l'accès au marché euh, lié à la question des droits de l'homme. Et on aura, en tant que socialiste et démocrate, un travail essentiel à faire sur le chapitre « Développement durable des accords commerciaux ». Vous savez que c'est ce euh, une, une demande qui a été formulée par les socialistes et démocrates depuis longtemps. Aujourd'hui, on voit que la Commission est en train de bouger sur la question du chapitre développement durable et euh, sur sa, ses mécanismes de sanction. En tant que socialiste et démocrate, on est ravi évidemment de voir que ce que l'on prône depuis des années, eh bien c'est en train de bouger. Donc il y a des gens qui finalement pensent qu'on n'avait pas vraiment tort. Euh, ça fait toujours plaisir hein, parce que parfois on a l'impression de prêcher un peu dans le désert. Mais, euh, mais non. Euh, maintenant, aujourd'hui, euh, des gens trouvent qu'on n'a pas tort comme il y a cinq ans, quand on disait qu'on ne voulait pas des ISDS dans les accords commerciaux, tout le monde nous prenait pour des fous, en tant que socialistes et démocrates, en disant « Mon Dieu, qu'est-ce qui va se passer Il n'y aura plus de protection des investissements. Ce n'est pas possible, ce n'est pas possible. » Et aujourd'hui, vous ne rencontrez aucun acteur qui dit qu'il faut un, encore un ISDS dans un accord commercial, que du contraire, tout le monde dit « Oh, mais ce que c'était incroyable, ces ISDS Ce n'est pas possible comme on pouvait donner autant de pouvoir à une entreprise. » Et donc, comme quoi, ben, ça fait toujours plaisir de voir qu'il y a des mouvements qui vont effectivement euh, dans ce sens. Ben, L'objectif aujourd'hui, c'est de voir un peu comment on peut soutenir ces mouvements, comment on peut compléter effectivement les travaux que nous sommes en train de faire euh, ici au niveau du, du Parlement. Et c'est extrêmement important parce que cette question de droits de l'homme, et nous étions, euh, Nacho et moi, euh, euh, dans une, une réunion des ambassadeurs, donc de nos représentants, au travers le monde, et il nous disait euh, de manière assez euh, homogène, je dois dire, euh, que ce soit en Asie, que ce soit euh, en Amérique latine, en Afrique ou ailleurs, il nous disait deux choses. La première, c'est que l'Europe est un vrai moteur et presque c'est presque l'unique moteur en matière de promotion des droits de l'homme sur la scène internationale. Et quand je dis l'Europe, l'Union européenne, donc c'est-à-dire nos délégations, et ça c'est plutôt positif, mais il nous disait aussi que les États membres, bah parce que vous savez que la politique étrangère, elle est quand même encore avec... Elle est aussi logée dans les États membres. Mais il nous disait aussi que les États membres ne prenaient aucune responsabilité en matière de droits de l'homme dans leur représentation diplomatique à l'étranger et qu'ils s'en référaient aux délégations européennes. Alors je trouve ça très bien euh, parce que ça voudrait dire qu'il y aurait une reconnaissance de la part des États membres du rôle de l'Union européenne euh, en matière de droits de l'homme. Ça, c'est ma manière positive de voir les choses, mais, parce que je suis une optimiste. Mais euh, ça peut aussi voir être vu d'un autre côté, c'est de dire finalement ça n'a pas beaucoup d'importance et donc on va le laisser faire par les autres. Et ça, ce serait un peu plus euh, négatif comme approche et surtout ça ne serait pas, euh, ça n'alimenterait pas une force qui est une force pour aller promouvoir les droits de l'homme à l'extérieur. Et donc il est nécessaire qu'on puisse travailler sur ce qu'on appelle ce Team Europe. Mais Team Europe, c'est pas que du business. Team Europe, c'est ce qu'il y a dans les traités européens et donc la question des droits de l'homme relève aussi des traités européens. Il me semble nécessaire de pouvoir le rappeler. Et donc un tout grand merci. Et je suis vraiment intéressée à entendre les échanges qui auront lieu autour de cette thématique droits de l'homme. Merci beaucoup. Uh, merci Maria. Uh, I think you have found the channels to receive in French is third, three, English two, Spanish eight, and Italian four. And we uh, have now another uh, 70 people connected uh, online uh, with us. Let's go to, I don't know if Venice with uh, Manfred Novak is the Secretary General of the Global Campus of Human Rights. Uh, 
Uh, Manfred Novas was appointed Secretary General in January 16. Uh, Manfred is the author of more than 600 publications in the field of constitutional, administrative and international law, human rights, as well as, as development studies. We also met last summer in, in the global campus. I don't know, Manfred, if you are staying till the end of the session, but at least some of your team has to do because I have found a task uh, to try to, uh, to demand on the global campus. Uh, Manfred, are you connected? Yes, I'm connected, yeah. Okay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, uh, Nacho, Maria, <clears throat> and all the others for, for inviting me uh, to speak at this important conference. Um, <clears throat> just uh, to explain, the Global Campus is a, a network of about 100 universities in all world regions. We are organizing seven master programs in human rights and democracy. Um, that is our core business, but in times of these enormous global challenges, we also feel a social responsibility of our member universities to take action wherever that is needed to uh, support human rights defenders. For example, after the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan, uh, we started a program with the support of the uh, European Union to provide a safe space for Afghan students and scholars at risk in our universities. <clears throat> the same is true for providing assistance to Ukrainian refugees, above all in our universities in the neighbor countries, Romania, Poland, for instance, uh, assisting them at the border, providing a space in the dormitories, uh, students, professors, everybody is really taking uh, action there. And with respect to supporting human rights defenders, we have a close cooperation, also a memorandum of understanding with the European Parliament. Uh, for many years, we organized the Venice School on Human Rights Defenders with Sakharov laureates, Sakharov fellows, linking them also with another network of right livelihood uh, laureates we are closely cooperating with. Um, and uh, we also reacted to specific requests of the European Parliament, such as having organized a special workshop uh, for human rights defenders in Belarus uh, when the demonstrations were, were on, on their hate. Um, and uh, also we are organizing, as Nacho said, since uh, two years, a high-level annual Venice conference on the global state of human rights in cooperation with the U uh, European Parliament in July. This year it was on children as future change makers, and there we took into account, of course, the EU action plan on human rights and democracy and the role of children in there. Now, uh, when we come to the, the toolbox, we should be aware that humanity is faced with three really existential threats uh, in, the, in the moment. The revival of uh, international armed conflicts and even threats with nuclear weapons, the environmental and climate disaster, and major threats caused by digitalization, artificial intelligence, disinformation undermining democracy. Um, and um, <clears throat> these as it, as it existential threats undermine, I would say, the whole post-World War II architecture of multilateralism, security, development, and human rights. They require a concerted global response based on rationality on the one hand and a human rights-based approach. And, as uh, Maria already had said, the EU has the potential, it's the main uh, international player um, to lead by example to pushing uh, human rights worldwide, but only if it is speaking with one voice and is consistent in its external and internal uh, policies. So um, <clears throat> when we see um, the reaction of the European Union to the war in the Ukraine, um, there's always um, kind of problems to get the unanimity uh, when Mr. Orban or others are not actually agreeing with certain uh, reactions. So perhaps now is really the time to push further the Article 7 uh, procedure in order to really be able to apply the toolbox that the European Union has at its uh, disposal. 
Now, what are these? I would just say a few of the, the main, the strongest powers that the EU has. It's the sanctions regime. Uh, but it should be also a little bit stronger, not only against now the Russian Federation, I think, where it is already very farly developed. Also, Iran, for instance, what is going on in the moment is really a, um, a, almost a kind of revolution in relation to China and the, the Uyghurs, Myanmar, and, and other countries. Second, I think a much stronger action to really regulate the global economy, financial markets, the transnational corporations. Um, Maria already mentioned the directive on uh, <clears throat> the supply chain due diligence. Uh, I think that is only a first step, and I agree with you that it needs to be strong. It really has to have an, an impact uh, on whatever human rights violations in the supply chain, whether it's child labor, whether it's forced labor, whether it's uh, all kind of forms of discrimination and other human rights violation. Um, but we need to be much stronger as the European Union in really applying stricter measures um, to achieve the Paris climate goals and other environmental goals to be to becoming climate neutral earlier than uh, 2050. Another area which is uh, partly foreign policy but also internal policy is, and that what I mean with really speaking with one voice and being consistent, is to introduce a much stronger common, a real common EU migration and uh, refugee policy uh, with <coughs> EU uh, organs and not really only coordinating 27 uh, different national politics. Uh, I think if we want to be taken seriously, uh, then we have to stop the major human rights violations at the borders, the pushbacks, etc. Uh, more visa liberalization in relation to Kosovo, also towards the Balkans, to be very, very clear on uh, Serbia, also on the Republic of Srpska in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in order to really um, have the, the necessary carrots and sticks um, also to deal with these major issues. And the most important one is to find, certainly, to an end to the Russian war of aggression against the Ukraine. These are a few of the, the tools that I feel are the most important today, but I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, by all my colleagues on what are specific tools the EU can and actually shall apply. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manfred. It's always a pleasure to, to have you on board. Let's start with the first panel, the EU human rights-based approach, introduction to the updated toolbox. And we are starting with Axel Marx. He is the deputy director at the Leuven uh, Center for Global Governance Studies, de la Univers University of Leuven, uh, funded in 207, uh, sorry, 2007, um, is a center of research uh, on humanities and social science. Um, Marx has been their research manager and senior researcher. As it, that's your, your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. Uh, as said, I'm uh, Axel Marx from the Leuve Center for Global Governance Studies, and we have been doing research on the interrelationship between trade policy on the one hand and human rights on the other, and uh, more broadly also on the re interrelation between uh, trade and sustainable development. And I was asked by the organizers to frame a bit uh, the overall, let's say, interactions between trade policy and the trade policy toolkit of toolbox to address human rights concern. Uh, and uh, my colleague, James Harrison, who will speak after me, will also then delve into some of the uh, issues I will mention. We have a bit of a, let's say, division of work in the sense that I will provide a bit of a broader picture. And then James will uh, introduce some specific uh, challenges based on the research uh, which has been uh, conducted. Next slide, please. So what I will first do is maybe say one or two words about international trade, why it's important, and also how it's changed. Then, and we already heard about that uh, earlier on, some of the human rights concerns related to trade. 
and the commitments actually of the EU to address these human rights concerns related to, to trade. And then I will briefly go into, let's say, four elements um, uh, related to the commitments by the EU or related to the toolbox of the EU with, uh, with regard to trade policy, namely some general commitments, the, uh, developments in the area of free trade agreements, FTAs, in which the EU is very prolific, uh, the application of the general scheme of preferences, GSP, which has an important human rights dimension, and then finally I will touch upon some of the regulatory measures which were also already mentioned earlier on, especially with regard to due, due diligence regulations. Across these different tools in the toolbox, I think there are some common challenges and common concerns, and I will briefly touch upon those um, as well. Next slide, please. So let us start with international trade and why trade policy is important. We already heard Professor Nowak say that one of, let's say, the important elements is to regulate more the global economy as an important tool to address human rights concerns. And trade is, of course, an important component of the global economy. And trade has proliferated uh, exponentially over the last five, six decades. And what you see here is a graph from the WTO, the World Trade Organization, basically plotting the evolution in the volume of trade, starting with the uh, created index on import and exports, which they fixed in 1950 on 100, and then plot over the last seven decades the strong increase. And you see two dips on 2008 and 2009 with the financial crisis and, of course, 2019, 2020 with the, with the COVID pandemic. But overall, the trend is very uh, a strong increase. And that, of course, makes a lot of us, our economies very dependent on international trade. We need international trade for jobs. We need international trade uh, for actu actually essential goods and, and so on, of which some consequences we see now. But trade has become an important engine of economic development. So on the one hand, we need trade to develop. Second important element to note about trade in our current discussion is that over the last decades, trade has not only increased in volume, but it has significantly changed in the nature of trade. And we highlight that with the emergence of what we already heard, supply chains, global value chains, and so on. The products we have today are constructed on parts which come from all over the world. And producers seek opportunities, cost advantages all over the world to gain competitive advantage. And this change in the nature of trade towards global value chains poses very specific uh, human rights concerns. But if the regulatory measures on due diligence might work, it also offers some opportunities to address them. But that's, of course, how we designed. Next slide. Now, if we think about uh, trade and human rights concerns, I think there have been many documented uh, human rights concerns related to trade. We all hear about the race to the bottom, and that's basically the lowering of social and environmental standards to gain competitiveness. And that often leads to very severe human rights abuses. We already heard about child labor. We already heard about forced labor but it's also about working hours, it's also about wages, it's also about all other things related to core labor standards. And due to dynamics of competitiveness, a lot of these uh, concerns um, emerge. Next slide. Uh, we also heard specific, um, I think this, yeah, uh, that we also heard the specific uh, concern about what companies are doing. And, um, in 2019, we published a report actually for this European Parliament on access to remedy uh, of human rights for human rights abuses by uh, companies in third countries. We try to understand uh, whether and how victims could get access to remedy if they were confronted with a human rights abuse by uh, European companies in third countries. And we actually analyzed more than 30 cases. And there we actually show that it's very difficult to get any access to remedy. It's very difficult to um, get human rights concerns um, uh, trialed and to get a uh, compensation. And we found many different types of how companies engage in human rights abuses. 
and the bump out of the due diligence regulation, of which we will hear a bit more, uh, tries to address uh, to a degree these issues, but it's a very important um, concern. Uh, next slide, please. Now, we looked at 30 cases. Uh, colleagues in, 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 in Spain, uh, Scheidel et al., they look at many more cases. They actually identified more than 2,700 what they call environmental conflicts, and they, these are cases related to environmental issues and environmental justice issues. It's about pollution by companies, it's by being threats to human rights defenders trying to protect the environment and these types of things. And they map them out over time, they map them out geographically, and they also map them out in terms of what types of human rights abuses are occurring with regard to environmental issues. And they map, of course, many cases, more than 2,700, and there are some which are around, uh, which actually deal with very severe human rights abuses, like assassinations, like killings, and so on. And these are often also related to global globalization dynamics uh, to global economy dynamics. So we have very strong concerns uh, related to the operation of the economy of global trade and international trade with regard to human rights protection. Of course, that's been recognized for a long time, and uh, a lot of actions have been taken which tries to integrate it. And in that respect, the EU already has taken action. Next slide. And that action, of course, is guided also by the treaty in which the protection of human rights is very prominent, and especially also in Article 21, where it states that the EU should not only protect human rights internally, but in all its external policies, try to pursue the protection of human rights. And, of course, as an exclusive competence, EU trade policy is a very important instrument to do that. And over time, the EU has tried to integrate or is integrating human rights concerns in different instruments related um, to trade policy. And in the first step, in terms of the operationalization of that, uh, there have been already ma many commitments made on integrating human rights uh, concerns in, 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 in trade policy. Next step. And these have been I think underlined by EU leaders in several occasions. They have been stressed in many different documents. All recent trade strategy documents refer very explicitly to that and especially also to sustainability protection. So there's been, let's say, a movement of trying to integrate uh, human rights into uh, trade policy. Next slide. Now, how does the EU try to do that? I think there are three major instruments that try to use to protect human rights uh, through trade. And of course, we can discuss later the effectiveness of these approaches and the concerns and the challenges. One is the use of free trade agreements. Um, the EU is very active, very prominent in trying to negotiate free trade agreements. And in that effort, they try also to include uh, the protection of human rights. And it does that in two instances in a free trade agreement. First, they integrate human rights uh, concerns of protection in what we call the essential elements chapter, which is the first chapter of any trade agreement, and in the so-called trade and sustainable development chapters, which are currently under review and where a lot of attention has gone to uh, addressing uh, especially labor rights concerns. Next slide. With regard to the essential elements chapter, that basically states most of the time as a first article uh, that uh, respect for human rights uh, should be the guidance uh, for both or more parties uh, uh, to the agreement. And if there are serious violations of human rights, uh, there might be a suspension um, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, trade agreement. Now, that uh, article is present in each of the free trade agreements of the EU, but it's never been used. And for some free trade agreements, I think there are uh, serious concerns on the human rights front, um, but potentially it's there to use it. Next slide. Second, and we will hear a bit more about that from James Harrison, there are the trade and sustainable development chapters 
in free trade agreements, which are there to uh, actually foster dialogue and to try to promote this idea of uh, taking sustainability and human rights concerns in, in, in trade relations. They often have a broad scope, but they're also quite unique if you compare it to many other free trade agreements of many other countries in that they try to not only stipulate certain commitments, but they also try to set up an institutional mechanism which monitors the implementation um, and, and so on. On the monitoring of the implementation, on the enforcement, there are, of course, many debates, many discussions, many skeptics, and we can rec return to that. But there's a tendency by the Commission to integrate it and try to strengthen it. How far it can go, what the results are, is, of course, open for discussion. Next slide. Then we have the general scheme of preferences, which gives preferential market access to developing countries to the EU market, so they get lower tariffs uh, if they want to export to the EU, and the EU makes that conditional on the ratification and implementation of a number of uh, international conventions, including human rights conventions, ILO conventions. This regulation has been in, uh, active since 1971. It's currently under uh, review because there need to be a new regulation by 2024, but that's a very strong instrument potentially to try to foster at least some awareness on human rights concerns in some of the developing countries. But also, as most of you will know, there are a lot of cases where there is a, a lot of debate on this and how to uh, strengthen the overall uh, approach to uh, uh, GSP. Then, finally, next slide, we have, of course, what we also heard already today, a new uh, development and that's so-called regulatory measures which integrate a due diligence approach in uh, global value chains to address human rights. And the idea is what Arno Bradford called to create some kind of a Brussels effect that by trying to regulate companies in the EU, they will export certain standards on human rights, on environment, social issues, and on uh, issues related to uh, uh, pinpointing down possible human rights risks in their value chains throughout the world. And uh, as you all know, the Commission has launched a proposal which is currently uh, under debate. Next slide. But that proposal actually fits in a wider trend of human rights uh, due diligence legislations uh, um, uh, which we can currently observe. And in our centre, we try to keep a little bit track of the different types of initiatives which are out there. I think we currently count around um, 16, 17 initiatives which are there related to human rights due diligence. You have, of course, the French law, you have the European proposal, you have in the Netherlands proposals, Germany, and, and so on. And they all go around the same logic of trying to use the value chains uh, which, on which uh, companies, especially in Europe, have leverage to address uh, some of the human rights um, uh, concerns. So this is part of the, let's say, the different tools uh, which the EU has at its disposal. There are, of course, across these tools, several concerns. And there are many debates, many studies, um, which uh, try to assess to what degree these approaches are working. And of course, a lot of issues uh, revolves around the effectiveness of the tools and the compliance. For instance, in GSP, does GSP regulation really foster stronger compliance with human rights and ILO conventions in developing countries? I think, uh, to say it mildly, the, the the data on that is very mixed, so it's very difficult to assess, but there is a general a feeling that compliance can be strengthened, and I think that also feeds into the, some of the current debates uh, on uh, the revision of the, for instance, the GSP regulation. Big uh, second point which always uh, emerges in many of the debates is really monitoring what is happening. Uh, on the ground, and in the case of free trade agreements, that relates to the role of civil society in monitoring compliance with human and labor rights on the ground. Uh, but also, for instance, when, within due diligence regulations, uh, there are certain commitments companies need to make on, to report on what they are doing, but do not necessarily have to disclose if there are really human rights concerns in their value chains and how they are addre addressed. So, Monitoring and strengthening monitoring will be an important 
uh, tool to uh, actually strengthen uh, the implementation of the commitments. In quite a few tools, there's the debate on the use of sanctions or not. Um, both in GSP and free trade agreements and so on, there are some who advocate that they should apply more strict standards, and that that means suspending uh, tariff preferences and these types of things. But we should also be aware that sanctions can have very negative effects, especially for poor people on the ground who might lose out uh, with the application of sanctions. And I think it's a very relevant, a very important, but also a very uh, sensitive debate. Finally, I noted down a uh, discussion on what we call distributional effects, and that specifically relates to the new measures on due diligence and global value chains. And that relates to the fact that um, if companies are implementing uh, due diligence through their value chain, it might be sometimes very difficult for producers in the global south to comply with certain requirements. And that then, of course, can create uh, that they lose access to European markets and that they actually lose access and, and money for their livelihoods. And that's a serious concern because for the moment we are developing these new due diligence regulations, but we don't really know what the socioeconomic effects of them are in developing countries. And it's one of the issues I think we have to have attention for. So that's in a nutshell, I think, a bit of the overview uh, of the EU toolbox with regard to trade policy and how it relates to human rights. I will thank you, Axel, for this excellent overview. Uh, finally, you, you reach uh, the, the dilemmas we have to deal with on a daily basis in the Parliament, how to balance sanctions and, and demands with the situation in poor countries. It's not easy, as you know, but it's our agenda, especially in DROA and in relation with other committees of this Parliament, like uh, trade. Uh, let's go to James Harrison in remote in, via web. It's an academic who research on human rights and environmental impacts of economic laws and regulation, has written on human rights, environment and trade, worked with numerous NGOs, United Nations agencies, and international organizations, including the Council of Europe and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, James, I hope you are there. Can you? Hello? Yes. Yes, okay, you can perfect, hear me. Okay. Perfect. Now it's okay. Thank you, James. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Uh, um, yes, yeah, so as you said, I'm a, I'm a professor in a school of law and a researcher around issues of trade, uh, sustainable development, human rights, labor, and environment. Um, and yes, I just building on really on what Axel said before and completely agree with the issues that he's uh, highlighted and the uh, the, 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 the challenges. Um, I wanted to focus on two particular aspects of the toolbox which he described and go into them a bit more detail. So those trade and sustainable development chapters in EU trade agreements and then the human rights due diligence process that Axel outlined to you. Um, and I think there are real opportunities uh, for, EU, for the, both these EU measures to make a positive human rights difference here but also really serious challenges and dangers and limitations. And so I think it's really important that key human rights actors, including yourselves, are scrutinizing new initiatives and in development and monitoring their implementation once they come into force. So caveat is that I don't know your state of knowledge about these issues. So I'm gonna describe them, um, some, of the, um, some of the sort of things that we know from academic research some of the basic issues, and then I'll highlight where we might want to follow up on more detail for discussion if you're interested, okay? So first of all, looking at trade and sustainable development chapters. Um, we've had these chapters in EU trade agreements since the 2011 Free Trade Agreement with Korea, and before that, even the CARIFORUM uh, EU Economic Partnership Agreement contained very similar provisions in, from 2008. So we've got a relatively long period to assess what their impact has been. Um, and I want to split their, their broad scope that Axel was talking to about, just crudely for the purposes of this, this discussion, into two basic types of provisions. So we, we've got commitments for trade partners, as well as actually the EU as well, to improve national level protection. So most notably, 
to ratify and effectively implement ILO core conventions and commitments in relation to environmental treatments, treaties like the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC. So that's one set of commitments. And then we've got another set of commitments to make trade between the parties more sustainable. So generally cooperative provisions on, for instance, sustainable forestry, fisheries, biodiversity, corporate social responsibility, and even human rights due diligence. So neither of these sets of provisions have been traditionally found by academic re research to be very effective. So commitments on conventions, um, the trade partner, go government officials have seen those as externally imposed by the EU and so haven't seen them as a set of priority for implementation. And EU officials have generally had a limited understanding of domestic political dynamics in trade partner countries and so have struggled uh, to make progress on them as well. And then secondly, those commitments to make trade more sustainable um, have generally been in the form of soft cooperation, which has been found by research to often be vague and restricted in scope, vigor, and potential future impact. So there have been problems across the board with the effectiveness of these provisions, and there's been a series of reviews to try and improve their effectiveness. And the latest was in July this year, and the Commission made commitments to improve the focus, the focus of sustainability objectives and to improve monitoring and enforcement of provisions. So there's a detailed set of uh, recommendations on how this will be done. And we'll have to see how this plays out. It's uh, early days, obviously. And again, I can say more about this in, in discussion. One thing it's worth pointing out is the focus has been very much on the, in terms of enforcement, is on the dispute resolution provisions. So how these are enforced and if, an idea that you have a, a harder enforcement pro process in future trade agreements, and perhaps not enough focus on the provisions themselves. So making sure that they're tightly defined, that they use language that's uh, sort of mandatory, shall not, should, or take steps towards, and those kind of issues. Um, I can say more about that in discussion, but overall, if we look at these policy instruments, it's also worth saying that I think what academic research find is also that we have, we've seen more potential to create change with these instruments before trade agreements are signed. And a recent example of that is the Vietnam EU trade agreement where labor commitments, um, I, uh, commitments to sign ILO, rat ratify ILO um, conventions were made before the trade agreement came into force. And then it's been tougher to provoke change once trade agreements are then agree once they're enforced to use these trade and sustainable development commitments when trade agreements are enforced. And the real example people use here is the EU career agreement where there has been um, a commitment to change the law now, but only after a 10 year um, campaign by trade unions and civil society organizations. And so it, it's tough in the, even in those extreme situations to get change once the agreements are enforced. But overall, I think we'd also say that it requires extensive engagement between EU actors and key domestic actors in trade countries, to partner countries to be effective. So with members of parliament, with trade unions, with civil society organizations to understand the campaigns that are happening domestically and to try and tie EU um, uh, 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 demands into those kind of domestic campaigns. And so I think human rights actors like yourselves can become involved in that and very effective in those processes. The other thing I wanted to say on about TSD chapters is they're still, very much focused on these national action from trade partners. And there's a very limited focus on making trade between the parties more sustainable. So in the, in the latest um, commission proposals, there's only one new promise really to prioritize market access for environmental goods and services. And no real further attempt to think about how expanding trade may lead to increased production and trade of unsustainable goods. And there's really just a, a vague commitment to consider that in the context of sustainab sustainability impact assessments. And I think there's a real need to improve sustainability impact assessment methodologies to better consider human rights and environmental and labor issues. And again, that's something I could say more about in discussion if there's interest in that, in that particular aspect. Um, and there's also missing elements as well, I think, from the discussion. So no attempt to use differential tariffs to achieve social and environmental objectives, which has been a proposal made by 
uh, a number of actors, including the Netherlands and French governments, and no consideration of dispute settlement focused on corporate actors, as we've seen in the US agreement with Mexico, Canada, um, uh, and, the, and the US. Um, so again, I could talk a little bit about those models if there's more interest in thinking about those as a potential additional tools for trade policy. Um, interestingly, and Axel touched upon this as well, unilateral trade policy is, is kind of much more ambitious on this trade agenda. So these proposed regulations on deforestation-free products and on forced labor, the idea is to prevent goods being placed on the EU market that are produced with forced labor or through action that increases deforestation. And again, I can go into the detail of these proposals in discussion, but they're likely to have much more impact on trade between the parties than the TSG chapters in trade agreements because they cover all EU trade, they set enforceable conditions, and they don't need to ne negotiate it with trade partners. We'll have to see what the final proposals look like, um, but I suppose one concern there is will they take into account sufficiently the concerns of the trade partners about these issues? So I had some discussions with civil society organizations in Brazil and Indonesia about the deforestation regulation, where questions are raised about definitions of key terms, the effect on small and medium-sized enterprises, and who will bear the costs of upgrading. So the kind of concerns that Axel was talking about when thinking about the, the effect of these instruments on, on third countries. And that's a particular concern of unilateral measures because they haven't been subject to those processes of negotiation. So if I, I'm still okay for time, I just wanted to move on and talk about due diligence briefly. Um, so this is the other, the other policy instrument I wanted to discuss. Uh, and due diligence is important to several of the initiatives I've already discussed. So it's, it's, it's part of the deforestation free goods and forced labor regulations. There's a due diligence component to that. But I wanted to focus on the more general human rights due, due diligence initiatives that Axel, Axel talked about. Uh, and how they're expanding. So in addition to those that Axel talked about, there's also a number of proposals in South and C Central American countries who are considering legislation uh, for human rights due diligence. So I think this is a really important global phenomenon and potentially one of the most important policy mechanisms for holding companies accountable for human rights issues in their supply chains and for taking action on them. But also lots of debates about and problem uh, uh, and about the problems and limitations of mandatory human rights due diligence. So, with the EU directive, we have debates about its scope and the, the nature of the legal liabilities it creates. And I suppose beyond that is the key question of will the EU directive and other initiatives improve human rights outcomes on the ground? And I've recently finished interviewing more than 20 of the leading human rights due diligence practitioners um, who undertake human rights due diligence for hundreds of companies worldwide. Um, and, and what I got from that research was I think at the moment we have not enough focus on the process by which human rights due diligence is done. So it's generally involved a process that involves consultants working for companies so understanding how those actors work is vital, how the work that consultants do and the interactions between those consultants and companies to produce the human rights due diligence is vital. And I just want to give you three key insights from, uh, from those interviews I've conducted and the research which is ongoing into that. So firstly, there are many inconsistencies in methodology about in the human rights due diligence that is done by these consultants for companies. So in the extreme example, for some practitioners I spoke to, human rights due diligence involves many weeks of talking to rights holders in the field. For others, it's a desk-based risk analysis. So that's an extreme example, but there are many, many more inconsistencies between different methodologies, and we have to understand them and I think gain more consistency about method in the field. Secondly, this whole process is very dependent on the consultant and company relationship to make it work. And I catalog lots of issue of pressure from companies on consultants at various stages of the process, in terms of the price of the work, the scope of the, of the due diligence process and the findings that they produced. And I think we have to understand these pressures and help consultants to be truly independent in the process of undertaking uh, this human rights due diligence for companies. Um, and I can say more about that as well if people are interested. 
And thirdly, I think we've got to be really concerned about the great expansion of human rights due diligence that this mandatory human rights due diligence uh, legislation in the EU and elsewhere will cause and what it will do to quality. So at the moment, we have a small number of expert consultants who are doing this work for a small number of co companies who are mostly doing it on a voluntary basis. And soon we're going to have thousands of companies who will be needing to do this on a mandatory basis. And there is a da real danger of a race to the bottom. There will not be the expert capacity from the human rights consultants out in the field to do this work. There will be the entrance of a, a, a number of purely commercial providers. And we need to make sure, we need to think about the work that's likely to be done as a result and the quality of the work that we've done uh, by these consultants. One final comment then just about the, the um, EU directive more, more generally. It also includes a complaint mechanism, um, and complaints mechanisms are becoming a more important mechanism for dealing with corporate human rights issues. So, so this is really exciting, and I've done a lot of work on what makes for an effective complaints mechanism in relation to corporate conduct. And I think the EU regulation here needs to do a lot more on setting out vital aspects of what a robust complaint system is in terms of its independence, its accessibility to rights holders, and its ability to provide a remedy to them. So again, I can talk more about that in discussion. But overall, I think, just reflecting, I think there is a need, real need for detailed engagement from concerned human rights actors all the way through the initial development of these policy tools to the way in which they are implemented in practice to ensure they really make a difference to the human rights situation on the ground. Oh, thank you, James. Uh, again, like in uh, Axel's case, uh, you raised some of our concerns that we had to deal, for, uh, to deal with uh, on a daily basis, mainly how to enforce uh, our capability to, to put in place uh, the provisions of our trade agreements. And for that reason, the second panel is from advocacy to action, not always easy. Uh, we have time for a couple of short questions or comments to our first uh, panelists, if we want to keep our schedule. Is anyone in the hall or among uh, 100 uh, followers of the session uh, able to, uh, wishing to ask some question? Uh, okay, thank you. It's not the case. Len, um, then let's go from advocacy to action. That is the second panel for which we have um, the pleasure of the company of uh, Gisela, Gisela Castro, uh, Human Rights and Democracy Network, uh, is coordinating the European Parliament Working Group. It's checking us or um, testing us uh, in our compliance, uh, uh, contributes to the enhancement of the European Parliament action on human rights and democracy, and supports the European Union role as a global actor on these issues through engagement with this Committee on Human Rights and the Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, Gisela, so to Gracias. Um, hello, everyone. Um, indeed, I am... Um, I work at FIDH, International Federation for Human Rights, but I'm here representing a wider network of NGOs, HRDN. It's about 60 organizations um, that work on human rights, democracy, and peace. Um, and I coordinate the, the European Working Group um, uh, in that network. Um, I just wanted to, to say that uh, the talk, talking points that, um, that I have prepared um, have been uh, prepared with, with the help of uh, our members, so it reflects um, the views of, of um, most of our, our members. Um, so I want to focus on two main uh, recommendations for the European Parliament and for its role in, the, um, in improving or strengthening the EU's human rights action in foreign policy. Um, and so the first recommendation that we have is that we need political support from the European Parliament to improve the coherence and consistency of EU foreign policy. As some of the previous speakers have uh, mentioned, the, there, is, um, there are great disparities in the way that the EU uh, deals with certain situations. In particular, when you look at um, the use of diplomacy and public diplomacy. So um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure no one is surprised here when I say that when the EU deals with uh, Egypt or India or Saudi Arabia, it doesn't do it in the same way that it does with smaller countries where, or, or, or countries in which there is less of, of a strategic um, interest for the EU or perceived strategic interest for the EU. Um, 
And so um, from, from HRDN, we, we obviously we challenge the, uh, the, those disparities in, in, in the sense that we, uh, we believe that they um, encourage um, uh, and reinforce um, a sense of impunity for, uh, for the perpetrators of, of, um, of human rights violations in those countries because they see that there is no consequence um, um, of, of their violations on their, um, the, the, the regime's stance on the, on the international scene. Um, and, and for that, the European Parliament has a, a strong role because, um, it, and it has been very helpful up until now, the European Parliament, to uh, highlight some of the situations that other EU institutions turn a blind, blind eye on, um, and not to name them, I'm talking about the European External Action Service and the Council and, and Member States. Um, and so uh, on some of the countries that I just mentioned, Egypt, for example, the, the European Parliament has, very, uh, has been very helpful in adopting resolutions, talking about the situation and addressing recommendations to other institutions um, and, and kind of keeping them in check and keeping them accountable. Um, I also wanted to talk about the example of India. The, the, the human rights situation in India has been uh, drastically deteriorating over the past, uh, past few years. And there is a coalition here of, of NGOs that has been working to put the human rights situation on the, in India on the EU's radar, and it has been very difficult. Um, and thankfully, the European Parliament did adopt uh, one report last uh, year in 2021 where this uh, human rights situation was mentioned and some concern was expressed, which um, at the time was the only European institution who who, uh, who said anything about the, the human rights situation. Uh, since then, we have gotten a couple of tweets from the EU Special Representative on, um, on Human Rights, which are welcome, but more needs to be done. And, um, and, and so for this, it's, it's very important that the, the European Parliament keeps this role. Um, there are some things that the EP can do to improve the way it does this, and um, my colleague Sylvain will, will certainly uh, talk about them. So um, um, I won't go into details, the second recommendation that I, want, that I wanted to make is also about political support, but specifically uh, for civil society and human rights defenders. Um, so um, human rights defenders and, uh, need the financial support that the EU gives them, but it, they also need um, political support. And for that, HRDN is uh, currently working on two initiatives uh, on which the European Parliament has been very active. Uh, one is improving access um, to visas for human rights defenders, and two is improving the implementation of the guidelines on human rights defenders by the EU delegations. And I know, again, that the Parliament is very active, proactive, um, and, and that help is, is noted and, and welcome. Um, so I won't go into details, I'm happy to, to develop in, in the discussion if you're interested. Uh, but I did want to talk about another aspect of, of this support to civil society and human rights defenders, which is access, um, um, civil society access to EU institutions. Um, HRDN, our uh, network, conducted a survey this year um, in, in the spring on um, how our members um, accessed the EU institutions and whether, um, and how, how was the quality of those interactions? And what uh, the results were was um, 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 that many of our members see that there is a deterioration in the access to EU institutions and in the quality of interactions. And that uh, most members also um, believe that this is due to an already existing tendency that is aggravated by COVID-19. So it's not only COVID, which obviously had a, a strong impact, but it's not, it's not only that. Um, what does it mean? It means that um, as NGOs working in Brussels, also human rights defenders walking, uh, working sorry, in countries trying to access EU delegations, um, we see that um, the, the, there is a diminishing access to, to, to the decision makers, mostly at high level. So we have more trouble getting uh, meetings with higher level officials. We have trouble um, um, inputting into high level meetings such as um, summits, for example. There is no systematic practice of consulta consultations for, of uh, uh, human rights uh, organizations and democracy organizations ahead of summits. Um, even though, as some of the speakers mentioned, um, uh, you know, it's in the treaties that human rights uh, should be at the, at the heart of, uh, of the EU's foreign policy, including at high level, including in, in, in the summits. Um, another uh, result from the survey was that there was a perceived lack of, of genuineness to the consultations, meaning uh, 
a lot of consultations with civil society occur very late in the process of policy making, when all the, the main and most important political strategic decisions have been made. So, and this is not the case of all uh, consultations, but, but some um, occur very late and, and uh, for us, um, we perceive them as, as being more information sessions about what the EU has decided and, and they keep us informed, which is, is nice, but, but we also have as civil society um, things to, to bring to the table in terms of, of strategic thinking. Um, and this is something that, by the way, the EU has recognized many times in many policy papers, um, uh, such as the Action Plan on Democracy and Human Rights. Um, and um, so, and, and sorry, another just last um, thing that came out of the survey is also the reliance on individual goodwill of the officials. Uh, most of the time, it's, uh, it, the, whether you have a good interaction with, with one aspect of the one um, part of the institutions or another depends on who holds that position at that time and whether this person is keen on interacting with civil society or not. Um, so, um, what can the EP do, the, the European Parliament? Um, again, we need political support for this. Um, the survey was conducted in the spring. We have now sent it, um, you know, sent it around, informed um, our partners at the European Commission, at the EAS, in the member states, um, and we are getting meetings uh, with some of these um, stakeholders to advance um, um, some of the recommendations that we make. Um, and the main thing is that we. Um, the survey also highlighted good practices, some, some very good practices um, in some um, parts of the institutions that are very good, including the European Parliament, by the way. Um, and so we want to build on those practices uh, so that they become systematic. Um, and um, specifically regarding the, the European Parliament, so again, uh, political support uh, helping us you know, br bring these, um, these um, concerns to the attention of other institutions included in the reports um, for instance, the annual report on human rights and democracy, but not only, um, um, you know, um, supporting this uh, this um, access to to institutions, and also another recommendation would be to systematize the, um, civil society consultations at the EP, because we have very good partners within the European Parliament, some of most of whom are in the room today, um, and, but. Um, it's not a, um, a systematic practice either. For instance, when we talk to uh, EP delegations, um, for instance, we want to input before they go on mission to a certain country and, and, and give them um, you know, input about uh, who they should meet or what are the main concerns. Um, this is feasible with some delegations and with some others, it's, it's less um, uh, easy. And, um, and so we would like um, the European Parliament to really um, um, uh, improve it, the consistency in the engagement with civil society and and so initiatives like uh, the one uh, today that this event today is is uh, extremely welcome and, and should be uh, replicated uh, many times um, these are the the main things that uh, that I wanted to say we have many other recommendations on how the European Parliament can improve uh, its support uh, for uh, human rights uh, my colleague Silva and Tika will uh, definitely um, uh, share some of them, but we have a lot of written uh, also documents that I'm happy to share with the audience today um, uh, so that um, that you can uh, see what what uh, our network um, thinks uh, can improve uh, the work of the European Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Isela. Yes, you are touching. <laughs> touching very relevant uh, issues in, in our daily work also. Uh, Sylvain, it's your, it's your turn. Sylvain is representing Euromed Rights. He's head of advocacy in this organization. He has professional experience with NGOs and the United Nations and the European Parliament in the field of human rights, humanitarian aid, and international development. Sylvain. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez Amor, and thank you, Gisela, for uh, making my presentation easier. <laughs> um, so, yes, I am head of advocacy at Euromed Rights, which is a member-based organization working on human rights, democracy, and the rule of law in the Euro-Mediterranean region. And we are also a member of the network that Gisela mentioned, the Human Rights and Democracy Network. And as Gisela did, I'm going to share an NGO perspective that I believe and know is, um, tends to reflect the views of many of my other colleagues who work on advocacy at EU level and, of course, on human rights, democracy and the rule of law. And in my case, I'm going to 
to raise two main points, one on urgency resolutions and the other one on mainstreaming, mainstreaming human rights uh, throughout the work of the European Parliament. If I start with the first one, the urgency resolutions, so urgency re resolutions are the, you know, the, the monthly resolution adopted in the plenary. They are uh, very useful because they highlight flag, uh, flag, flagrant violation of human rights across the world. And it has had an added value from our perspective as NGOs. They not only highlight problems, but they contain calls to actions, which we believe, and calls to actions directed at the EU institutions, and we believe that they are more, they're one, of their, one of the most, if not the most interesting uh, piece of urgency resolutions. And despite not having any, maybe not any, but despite not having a specific legal bite to them, Urgency resolution, they do send a message to civil society organization and human rights defenders in the affected, uh, in the specific country. And what is very interesting is that, again, despite the legal buy to them, they very often stir reactions from the government authorities of those countries, which shows that it has a, an impact. That is for the added value. Of course, we believe that there are, all, there are always ways to improve, and the challenges with urgency resolution it relates a bit to what was said by Gisela, is that the selection of topics for urgency resolutions, they are made, they are the results of an agreement between political groups, so it's very political, but sometimes from the NGO perspective, we deplore that uh, they are in some cases a form of double standard, meaning we select some countries and topics instead of others, even though we can argue that in some cases they they are all deemed, I mean, some of them are very urgent and concern flagrant violation of human rights. And the problem is this tendency tends to undermine the coherence of the EU and specifically here the European Parliament as a vocal actor on human rights regardless of the, of the country and situation. And the second challenge with urgency resolution is that once they are adopted, they do contain calls to actions, but they need to be followed up more consistently. Otherwise, it, it remains a, a useful, but just, you know, words on paper. So it needs to be followed up uh, consistently, especially because there are calls to actions to, to, to institutions. And that's, uh, and basically what we are asking the European Parliament is to, in so far as possible, to uh, use its role as a supervised, as a monitoring body of the work of the other EU institutions, which is a role, one of the role of the European Parliament. So if I would like to mention regarding the urgency resolution, the main recommendations that we have, the first one would be to minimize and if possible, do away with what of us perceive as double standards, meaning be vocal on all human rights issues, regardless of the country or the situation, even though you might, the countries are considered strategic partner. They are strategic partner, but we should be able to be vocal and say when the problems are obvious, and especially when they concern flagrant and urgent human rights situations. The second is, is maybe more technical, but not so much, but it has come to our understanding that the European Parliament would like to reduce the length of the urgency resolution, which is not a bad thing per se. We just want to make sure that when you reduce the length of the urgency resolution, it does not come at a price of, uh, ditching the calls to uh, to action to other EU institutions, which are the, the most, uh, for us, the most interesting thing that we can use to uh, to leverage against other EU institutions. And the third point is, of course, well, the the recommendation to, to, to the challenge in, in terms of consistency uh, regarding the follow-ups to the urgency resolutions. And it should be made more consistently, so we make sure that they do not just remain words on paper. So that was the first point related to urgency resolutions. The second point is, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, on mainstreaming human rights through the work of the European Parliament. So the subcommittee, Droit, 
is the one responsible for human rights in, uh, in EU is external action. And it has been very positive, at least from our perspective as NGOs. Uh, and as Gisela said, we do have, we have found listening ears from members of the European Parliament of this uh, subcommittee of Droit, and of course, even allies uh, among the MAPs and, and the, the advisors. But uh, there are still some challenges, and I'm going to mention three of them that relates to the fact that Droit is a subcommittee, which means that it has a parent committee that is AFET, so the Foreign Affairs Committee. The first one is that the, the fact that you have a specific committee dealing with human rights may uh, give the impression that is sometimes reflected in practice that human rights can be dealt with in isolation, like another variable. And the, the problem is, uh, well, A, we don't believe that it is the case, and B, it goes against the, the idea, at least what the EU says, that the human rights should be mainstream in all, into all its policies and programs. The second uh, problem that we have with uh, having a subcommittee on human rights is maybe in terms of functioning. So I'm sure that many advisors, Droit advisors, MEPs member of that committee, we know that better than us, but it has come to our understanding that being a subcommittee, limits your autonomy and some of the decision that you might be able to do maybe on in terms of agenda or even in terms of the number of reports or decision that can be made because you have a parent committee which is AFET. So it's a problem in terms of functioning and the third is basically a, a matter of principle. If the article 21 of the Treaty of the European Union says that the EU action on the international scene shall be guided by human rights etc. is it feels like when you look at Droit and it is a subcommittee, then the current this, stru this structure does not reflect the primacy that this principle uh, seems to uh, to suggest. So that is going that leads me to two specific recommendations. One, uh, one may be more more difficult to implement because it is a very political decision. But but the first one. Uh, is at least the bare minimum. The first one relates to having, uh, making sure that Droit as a subcommittee has a shared competence over files and reports that have an external dimension. And we have come to understand that it's not always the case. And when it is the case, it has been um, a uphill battle. And the other more let's say complicated maybe recommendation would be to make Droit a fully fledged committee. And we understand that there might be skepticism regarding that, uh, that recommendation because some might say that the that Droit can remain, by remaining a subcommittee under AFET, it makes sense because it's, it is foreign affairs. It's just that from our perspective, uh, you have other committees on like INPA, uh, INPA like INTA, so for uh, the, the Trade Committee or the Development Committee or the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee, and they all deal with foreign issues. And it does not seem to undermine AFET's work, at least from, from our standpoint. And for us, maybe it simply shows that the European Parliament grants a specific importance to those topics. So I would end with that. If that is the case, then why should not be why should not be not be the case for human rights, which are described as a fundamental guiding value? And I think I'm going to end my presentation with that. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Shivan. Our last guest speaker is uh, Tina Tint Servatze from the Open Society European Policy Institute, where she is senior policy analyst. She maintains regular contact with the EU institution, monitors EU policies toward Eastern partnerships and Central Asian countries, and coordinates advocacy action targeting EU and other, institutional, other international institutions. Tina Tint, please.
Thank you very much, uh, Chair. And I have a very difficult task to keep your attention as a last speaker. And the subject I'm going to touch upon is also last resort. Uh, policy tool EU is using, uh, namely European Union sanctions toolbox. Uh, it's a last resort tool, policy toolbox, however, most powerful probably and rather uh, underutilized. And I'll try to touch upon in my presentation what is working and what is not working. Essentially, sanctions are the tool for the EU to go beyond rhetoric and showcase EU foreign policy in action, where EU political voice uh, matches its economic weight. And I would like to start with a positive story where to say that EU has become, if not a global, certainly a regional actor in utilizing sanctions in European region. Despite its very complicated decision-making structures, unlike other imposing sanctions imposing actors, we have seen time and again you has managed to come together, overcome consensus, and you, uh, translate its economic power into the, to achieve its political uh, foreign policy objectives, to counter human rights, to speak against violations of international law. What we have seen also is against the backdrop of impossibility to use UN as a sanctions imposing instrument, we have seen increased use of unilateral EU sanctions. Out of the 40 regimes currently in place, we have seen 25 are unilaterally adopted by the EU and EU has four thematic regimes. Uh, we have seen also over the last decade uh, consistent transposition and adherence to the EU sanctions by other non-EU European countries, such as Norway, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, uh, enlargement and neighboring countries. There is a recent study about this by the European Security, which has showed the consistency of this transposition. And this is very important when we talk about effectiveness and efficacy of the EU sanctions, not only how they are designed, but how much they are adhered or transposed by others. And the last point in this section I would like to make is a new type of multilateralization in the face of collapsing UN as a multilateral space where sanctions can be imposed. We have seen the new emergence of new multilateralization where European Union, United States, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia and other actors have come together during the severe crisis in 2020 in response to a crackdown in Belarus, in 2021 in response to Myanmar and the most recent Russia's war in Ukraine, where these actors have imposed sanctions in close coordination with each other. This doesn't mean there are complete overlap in designations, but there is a strong political signal sent by these actors denouncing human rights violations jointly. What I want to do now to touch upon on two things, the EU's use of human rights sanctions and what it can do better, and use lack of anti-corruption sanctions. You adopted global human rights sanctions regime in 2020, and it's one of the forms of multilateralization of the sanctions because other actors such as United States, UK and Canada already had such regimes in place. And EU is not, uh, there is no, EU is, no, is not novice in human rights sanctions utilization out of the 40 sanctions regimes, 16 are on the human rights theme. But the adoption of the sanctions regime has raised expectations that EU can use sanctions, human rights themed sanctions in more flexible manner and responsive in situations where there are impossibility to impose country regimes. What we have seen till now is underutilization of this regime. It's been two years. It will be two years in December. The regime has been adopted. We, I don't want to make this about numbers only, but numbers are important indicators, but there are much more qualitative indicators we can look into probably. There are 23 designations in two years, uh, 18 individuals and five entities. Only six countries globally have been targeted and only four regions. Out of the total designations, vast majority, almost 45% designations come are, are all related to one country, uh, Russia. And I think there's a greater need to diversify the pool of countries where you can respond in much more flexible and responsive way to human rights violations. Other issues mentioned by, the, 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 during the presentation about trade is the effectiveness, monitoring and enforcement. These are all very, very important aspects of sanctions. I, I think I can repeat everything that was said by previous speakers, so I would like to put it there for sanctions to be 
impactful all these three factors are important. Regarding civil society, I will not dwell upon the role of civil society. It has been mentioned many times by in this house. One important thing I would like to underline is not only to listen to civil society in terms of recommendations, but there can be much more proactive or innovative ways of working with civil society, let's say, when there's a sanction imposed against individuals in a certain country, the specific support could be given to civil society in that country and this way matching the support. Like specific examples can be given on gender-based and sexual violence where if sanctions are imposed on this specific theme, socioeconomic, socio, socio psychological support can be given to the victims, for example, and we can go on and on with different topics this way. Um, uh, I will go now to the anti-corruption sanctions regime and lack of it. Um, it has been debated in this house a lot. We have seen for the first time announcement by the President of European Commission a month ago in this house that you will adopt such a sanctions regime, which is a very welcome development. It has been for the first time this kind of announcement has been made on such a level. But there have been question marks and question marks about added value of this regime. And I'll try to outline what have been the question marks and try to rebuke those arguments in my last part of the presentation. The major concern of anti-corruption sanctions regime is the way sanctions are designed as a policy instrument, namely that such restrictions would not necessarily coerce kleptocrats into behavioral change. And then there's a strategic ambiguity around objectives of this type of sanctions. And there are the questions whether existing uh, country regimes cannot be utilized in specific cases to uh, sanction um, economic and financial enablers. And I would like to use three arguments why this, these uh, narratives are not correct or are not right. First of all, we should try in a policy debate at least, not if, even if not in legal terms, look at sanctions outside of the box of coercion. Sanct Anti-corruption sanctions can be effective to disrupt the networks, specifically to disrupt kleptocratic networks. Traditional way of looking at sanctions is coercion and paying gain approach. However, we, ha we shouldn't discount the constraining and signaling effect of sanctions where these kleptocrats, for example, they try to stack their ill-gotten assets in the Western financial system. Second aspect to look is at disabling networks. And this is an important lesson to be learned from the counterterrorism sanctions. 20 years ago, when counterterrorism sanctions were designed, they were not designed with uh, objective in mind to change the behavior of terrorist groups. They were designed with an idea to cut off their access to the Western financial system, and this objective has been achieved, and we should look at anti-corruption sanctions with the same prism, that we should disable their access to the Western financial system. And here, multilateralization is key, because if you, if you have one actor imposing sanctions to a specific kleptocrat, they might have access in other currency or in other jurisdiction, and that's why multilateralization is key here. Linking to the same point, my second point will be the protecting the integrity of the domestic institutions. We know all too well that there are the ill-gotten proceeds come to the Western financial system, and it really under, um, erodes the trust of citizens in democracy, in rule of law. And here it's very important we have whole of the government approach when we talk about anti-corruption sanctions. It's not only an instrument to, to punish somebody outside, but it is also to protect integrity of domestic institutions. And my last point will be to complement anti-money laundering legislation. EU has a golden standard, anti-money laundering legislation. Sadly, the implementation is not as golden. Uh, there are many reasons why this is the case, the lack of the resources, lack of the cooperation, lack of the political will. And here, anti-corruption sanctions can be a complementary tool where the investigations or cross-border investigations take a very long time. Sanctions, in fact, can be imposed in a much faster way, much more flexible way. Evidentiary standards are much lower than one would need in, during investigations. Thus, having this instrument will give you, give you a one step further before investigations are completed. I'll leave it there. I have other more legalistic uh, points, but if there are interest in those points, I'll take during questions, but I'll stop here my intervention. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Tina Ting. I'll, I'll go later to many, many issues that has been evoked in my final remarks, but before I would like to offer you, uh, Isabel, or any other uh, person in the 
in the room, uh, question or short comments. Please, madam. Oui, bonjour. Euh, je m'appelle Stella Velicki, je suis physicien informaticien et je suis une très fervente personne pour le respect des droits de l'homme. Moi, j'ai trois questions concernant euh, trois pays euh, assez clairs. Euh, vous avez beaucoup de contrats euh, et de traités avec la Chine. Est-ce que vous avez euh, discuté de non-respect des droits de l'homme de la minorité ouïghour Ouïghour qui se trouve dans des camps de concentration où les femmes sont stérilisées par la force, par le gouvernement chinois. Est-ce que, est que même vous avez discuté de ça ou est-ce que... Ou est il n'y a personne qui discute de ça. La deuxième, c'est Qatar. Qatar, il va tenir le championnat mondial de football. Il y a 6 000 de travailleurs en majorité étrangères de Inde et de Pakistan qui sont morts pendant les travaux qu'ils ont faits pour construire les stadions et les hôtels. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un qui a fait des analyses à cette situation pour voir... Pourquoi C'est énorme, 6 000 de, de travailleurs qui sont morts, hein, c'est énorme. Hein. Euh, on sait qu'en Qatar, il y a un régime dia, euh, islamiste, la femme a une situation de semi-esclavage et, et, et des choses comme ça. Hein. Euh, ça, c'est une chose que je, je demande. Qu'est-ce qu que vous pensez de faire pour montrer qu'il que n'y a aucun respect pour les travailleurs étrangers en Qatar et le dernier pays, c'est la Russie. Moi, je ne me parle pas de le génocide et de tous les crimes de guerre qu'ils ont faits en, en Ukraine. Je parle des droits de l'homme, de non-respect des droits de l'homme des prisonniers politiques en Russie. Il y a longtemps qu'ici au Parlement et dans les institutions européennes, on parle, c'est un sujet tabou. Il n'y a personne qui parle de ça. Well, I, if I understood well, this, is, this question are to the European Parliament, not for, this, for the guests. Uh, for that, I'm, I'm just doing a, a quick remark. We have dealing with this through these three issues frequently, consistently, and flatly making a statement on every issue, giving the uh, Sakharov Award to a leader of Uyghur people, to a, a political prisoner in Russia. We have been uh, doing urgencies on the three issues. We have been uh, sending missions uh, to the countries. The next one is to Qatar in December, if I'm, if I'm not uh, wrong. Madam, these um, other hundreds of cases are on the daily agenda of the parliament. We have mentioned Uyghurs dozen of, of occasions, resolution, debates. We have dealing with other issues with, related to China, like Hong Kong. We have dealing with the situation in Russia well before the war, uh, regarding Navalny, regarding the, the, the forbidding of the radio. I don't remember the name of this uh, radio broadcasting uh, liberal in, in Moscow. Madam, these are our daily life in Droit Committee and in the, in the Parliament in general. These three cases and many other cases all over the world. Uh, you can be sure, you can be um, uh, sure that we are, we are dealing with these issues, uh, not only in the Parliament, of course, in Council and Commission and, and external service of the, of the European Union. But, uh, Madam, and then Isabel. Could you speak a little bit loud, please? Oh, there is no. Uh, it's, oh, sorry, it's sorry. a microphone. Yeah, my question. First of all, I would like to thank you so much for the efforts you are doing towards human rights. But my question is what measures are the human rights action taken to help the stranded students from Ukraine who are Africans? Because as an advocate, we are facing many challenges that, and we, they are finding it difficult. Their rights have been violated, they have been traumatized, and still now they are finding it difficult to settle in any European countries where they found themselves at. 
Still now we are trying to fix things for them, but it is so difficult for them. What measures is EU taking to help these students that are stranded and they were students in the Ukraine, but due to war, their rights have been violated and still they are trying to find it difficult to come together, to come out from this trauma. Sure, I, I have no... Uh, 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 Isabel, do you Can have any in? more information on that, please? Uh, even without voice, I can try to answer you uh, a little bit. Um, in LIBE, that is the committee in charge of these kind of issues, we are following the situation of uh, African people that were studying in Ukraine and tr are trying to reach um, European countries. And what is in the, in the measures adopted is that they have the same rights as Ukrainian people. So European countries should receive them and give them the right to asylum and to fulfill, uh, to, to follow their studies and their condition of living. Uh, thank you, Isabel. This is uh, Migration Vision on Libre Committee in the European Parliament, not in Do you want to add with your voice? Yes, <laughs> with, my, with my voice in these conditions, um, I, I would like to underline here one thing that is very important for us, but is a point for a reflection among us parliamentarians and uh, with uh, external action. Of course, it's uh, very important to have this sanction regime. It was a huge step, but um, it can't be a target step in some countries and we need to address that risk that we are facing now. Um, we are seeing this tool uh, very much focused in some countries and forgetting other countries and other situations. That is one point. The other point is of course, in situations that we, we know very well that we can't work with authorities by many issues, violations of human rights, corruption, money laundering, etc., 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 etc. We need to work with civil society. That is the only formula for a change in the countries. But when we work with civil society, we need to don't forget the, the little organizations because many times the support that is given by European Union is being given to big organizations and forget little organizations that are working every day with the people on the ground. And it's very important, don't forget them. Thank you. Tiretin on the first question on the geographical scope on sanction, and then you both on the other on issue. Thank you. Uh, I agree the, it shouldn't be the anti-corruption sanctions particularly, but any other, any horizontal sanctions shouldn't be, it should be depoliticized to a degree possible. And I think the lesson we can take from human rights sanctions utilization that this hasn't fully been the case from the EU side. Uh, the pool of countries selected for the sanctioning should be selected carefully. What you have seen also in human rights sanctions, these are mostly not free countries. We are currently doing analysis about how free, not free countries are, the corruption index, but there are violations also in uh, free countries and this hasn't been utilized there. So I think strategic strategic use, strategic use of this type of instrument is very, very important. So this should be the message from this house to the council while they will be negotiating the mandate of the sanctions regime. And to be how even though Parliament doesn't have a lot of um, weight in sanctions policies, I think its voice is very, very important in 
voicing what it should or shouldn't look like the new regime. Thank you. Um, Giselle and Sylvain on the big and minor organization. Sure, thank you. Uh, we, uh, of course, we agree, um, and I think uh, Sylvain and I come, both come from organizations that are networks uh, that include many small organizations as well that work in, in many of the countries, so completely agree. Um, I will comment on the political side, not so much on the, on the uh, funding side, uh, but um, this um, relates to, of course, the work on, on the implementation of the guidelines of, on human rights defenders, um, because when we look at uh, how EU delegations uh, use these uh, guidelines or implement them, we see disparities um, specifically when it comes to big versus uh, small organizations or famous versus less famous um, human rights defenders. And uh, one standing recommendation that we have had for I don't know how many years is that the, the EU delegations actually apply what was this in the guidelines of going out to remote areas where there are small collectives working on, on, on small communities um, to meet with the human rights defenders to support them and not only the ones that are in capitals, uh, also to request visits consistently for uh, human rights defenders who are in prison, including the ones that are less high profile. Um, and this is something that, um, that, that we completely agree and that we are pushing constantly with the delegations and with the EAS as well in order for, for the, the implementation of, of the guidelines to be, um, to be um, assessed and, um, and uh, um, encouraged. I agree with what Gisela said. Yeah, just to reinforce, uh, it is through my organization, we do work with uh, local NGOs, way smaller NGOs than, than we are, at least as a network. And yes, I, I would agree again with Gisela by saying we need, con we need to be coherent when there are flagrant violations of human rights, it should be raised and as much as possible publicly, and consistency in the application of the tool that already exists. And honestly, it's not always the case, mostly for other reasons, including very political reasons. Thank you, Sylvain. Um, I'm, I'm doing my, my closing remarks in Spanish, if you don't mind. Uh, you can follow in English in the three, English in two, French in three, and Italian in four. Um, gracias a, a, a todos uh, por venir, gracias a nuestros invitados, uh, Manfred, Harrison, creo que siguen uh, conectados. A mí me gustaría que, además de hablar de estas cuestiones prácticas de las que luego también comentaré, veamos el marco grande de lo que está pasando. A veces trabajando nuestros dosieres, cada uno con nuestras especialidades geográficas o temáticas, perdemos de vista el, el, la gran pantalla. Y es que estamos en medio de una guerra ideológica. Estamos en plena guerra cultural entre las democracias liberales y los sistemas autoritarios. Y, por tanto, algunas de las cosas de las que están pasando en el mundo tienen que ver, tienen que ver con eso. Y es bueno que todos los actores institucionales o, o privados o ONGs eh, del mundo seamos conscientes de que aquí estamos en trincheras de una, de una guerra cultural y una de ellas es eh, derechos humanos. Um, hasta no hace mucho tiempo los sistemas autoritarios, ¿qué nos decían? Necesitamos tiempo. Nuestro modelo de sociedad es el vuestro, pero por motivos religiosos, étnicos, culturales, geográficos, necesitamos tiempo para plantearnos reformas democráticas, plantearnos eh, libertades y ejercicios como los que tenéis eh, en Occidente. Eh, la otra gran eh, racionalidad era, primero, el desarrollo económico y luego, prudentemente, porque nuestras sociedades son distintas de las vuestras, algunas reformas políticas. Bueno, eso se ha acabado. Seamos conscientes, eso se ha acabado. Ya no piden tiempo. Ya dicen que tienen otro modelo de sociedad. Y lo dicen con una claridad con la que no la decían hace 15 o 20 años. Tanto seamos conscientes de que se están reasegurando en modelos que ellos llaman su democracia. La democracia que nosotros no podemos reconocer como tal, pero que ellos venden a sus opiniones públicas domésticas como democracia. ¿Por qué? Porque ellos siempre conservan la necesidad de una apariencia de legitimidad electoral. En ningún país autoritario ha desaparecido el tótem de la tribu de la urna, aunque no se pueda hablar de elecciones eh, 
eh, limpias y justas, siempre la apariencia de que el gran líder, que suele ser unipersonal, eh, tiene el apoyo directo del pueblo, sin las molestias que suponen los partidos y los parlamentos, sigue ahí. Por tanto, ese es un elemento que hay que examinar. Siguen queriendo aparecer como líderes democráticos, aunque las elecciones no lo son en ninguna, de ninguna manera. Y por eso, esa es otra derivada, la observación electoral se vuelve un elemento diferente de lo que era. Antes la observación electoral era para mejorar la forma en que hacían las elecciones los, las democracias poco maduras. Ahora, la observación electoral es el elemento de defensa de la democracia en términos mucho más duros. Y otra trinchera de esta guerra cultural es la erosión determinada y pensada y planificada de la universalidad de los derechos humanos. El que toda persona tenía un conjunto de derechos por ser persona es una conquista de la civilización, desde la Revolución Francesa, y no se había discutido. Se ponían otras excusas. Hoy ya no. Hoy el hecho de que las personas tengan derechos es una concesión cultural. Eh, es decir, eh, la, la imposición de la ideología colonialista occidental nos impone un conjunto de derechos que nosotros como sociedad no admitimos. Los derechos humanos no son algo universal, sino que dependen de nuestra tradición, nuestra cultura, eh, nuestra historia y esa, esa narrativa, especialmente china, es a la que se acoge en muchos países para comenzar a erosionar un elemento esencial de la civilización, no de la civilización occidental, de la civilización, que es que las personas, por el solo hecho de serlo, tienen derechos. Y eso ahora mismo está en cuestión. Esos derechos, en muchos casos, por ejemplo, los derechos que tienen que ver con, el, con, la, con la sexualidad, con la acción sexual, son sencillamente borrados de las, eh, en muchos sistemas autoritarios. Y por eso hay que salir. Hay que salir a, re, a reafirmarnos en nuestro concepto de derechos, aunque parezca que no hacía falta, vuelve a hacer falta. Y, por tanto, yo creo que las instituciones públicas y todos los agentes, especialmente eh, eh, organizaciones no gubernamentales vinculadas a derechos humanos, tenemos que salir a dar esa batalla grande. Luego hacemos las batallas de cada sitio, de cada lugar, de cada derecho, pero lo primero es reafirmarnos ante toda la opinión pública mundial, seguimos pensando que por ser personas tenemos un conjunto inalienable de derechos, porque hasta eso está poniéndose en lugar y por eso algunos hemos promovido lo que queremos llamar, eh, creo que Manfred está conectado, una liga de defensa de los derechos humanos, que en mi opinión debe ser salir a la opinión pública, las caras, las personas, los nombres, las siglas que toda la opinión pública mundial vincula con derechos humanos, a decir, seguimos reafirmando eh, los derechos humanos como un elemento esencial eh, de la civilización. Por eso lo decía Manfred, porque yo creo que una forma de visualizar eh, que todas las instituciones, estoy pensando en el Consejo de Europa, la Unión Europea, eh, OSCE, eh, todas las ONG que trabajan en derechos humanos, el lugar podría ser, Man ser Manfred la Conferencia de Derechos Humanos anual hecha por el Global Campus. El Global Campus no es una institución pública ni política, uh, es una institución que agrupa muchas universidades de todo el mundo. Podría ser un sitio en el que, de alguna manera, en la sesión del año que viene, reafirmáramos, teniendo allí las personas relevantes de todas las instituciones mundiales, nuestro compromiso frente a la lectura autoritaria de los derechos. Y vamos a, a la casa, porque ha habido muchas cosas eh, que se han comentado aquí. Como decía Axel, la Unión Europea no es corriente que las constituciones de los estados digan que su política exterior está vinculada o dirigida a los derechos. Por lo general, la política exterior de los estados, especialmente de los tradicionales, es la defensa de intereses. Bueno, la Unión Europea es, como en tantas otras cosas, una, una cosa rara, porque dice que su política exterior está inextricablemente vinculada a su defensa de, la, de los derechos, a la defensa de la democracia y del Estado eh, de Derecho. Eh, y, por tanto, asumámoslo todos. Pero están produciéndose algunas tendencias, algunas que se han dicho aquí eh, por parte de María y yo querría reafirmar. Se está produciendo un perverso eh, distribución de valores, un reparto de papeles perverso. 
las delegaciones de la Unión Europea de Derechos Humanos, los Estados miembros a vender trenes o a ayudar a empresas mineras. Eso es perverso. La defensa de los derechos humanos es una obligación de la Unión Europea y es una obligación de las delegaciones y de las embajadas de los Estados miembros. Y lo que estamos notando es que, como ya lo hace el embajador de la Unión Europea, el embajador del país miembro puede dedicarse a esa cómoda diplomacia económica que encuentra siempre sonrisas en los ministerios. Y el único antipático es el embajador de la Unión Europea y, hay que decirlo con todos los nombres, seguramente el embajador holandés o el embajador sueco. Poned presión poned presión, no solo en la Unión Europea, poned presión en las embajadas de los Estados miembros, porque tienen la misma obligación política que las embajadas de la Unión Europea y se están escondiendo uh, detrás de las delegaciones de la Unión Europea para hacer una política más, más cómoda. El, que, el hecho de que la Unión Europea tenga en su política exterior a los valores como un elemento esencial es incómodo y nos cierra muchas puertas. Y tenemos que ser conscientes, y tenéis que ser conscientes. Lo fácil es ser como China. China llega, invierte, pone dinero, trae trabajadores, hace muchas cosas discretamente y nunca pregunta por las cárceles, y nunca pregunta por la pena de muerte, y nunca pregunta por la situación eh, ambiental, ni nunca pregunta por la situación de los derechos indígenas. Por eso es más complicado hacer diplomacia cuando uno tiene que llevar una agenda de derechos humanos. Y hay que ser conscientes también de ello y entender que en algunos casos eh, la Unión Europea está jugando con desventaja frente a otras diplomacias, que no llevan este tipo de, de cargas y, por tanto, también pongámoslos en, en, en el análisis. No vaya a ser que convirtamos a la Unión Europea por un exceso de presión con esa agenda en una Unión Europea que luego no tendrá capacidades, precisamente, en muchas áreas del mundo eh, para hacer lo que otros, desde luego, no van, no van a hacer. El juego con las otras instituciones. El Parlamento Europeo es la, la institución más consistente en su defensa de derechos humanos y es lógico. Y cuando digo que es lógico, también tengo que tender la lógica de la real política del Consejo. Y hay que jugar en esa lógica en la que nosotros somos más exigentes, somos más vocales y tenemos que, no digo entender, ni siquiera admitir, eh, por lo menos racionalizar que en algunas otras cuestiones el Consejo actúe de otra manera. Pero nosotros no podemos rebajar la presión. Nosotros no podemos rebajar la presión. Y os recuerdo que las sanciones de derechos humanos son una vieja reivindicación del Parlamento. Y lo conseguimos. Y os recuerdo que la reivindicación de que en el sistema de sanciones de derechos humanos entre la corrupción es una de reivindicaciones del Parlamento que ha sido aceptada, al menos de momento, formalmente, por la, por la Comisión en el, único discurso, eh, en el último discurso de la, de la señora eh, von der Leyen. Pero a, con eso tenemos que jugar y con eso jugamos en este Parlamento. Y por eso tratamos de no, de no liberar nunca, eh, nunca la presión sobre las otras instituciones. Sobre si Drua debe ser o no un comité, hemos hablado mucho. Hay otros comités que dependen de, de AFED, como de Seguridad y Defensa. Sea cual sea el formato, nosotros seguimos trabajando en nuestra agenda sin mayores dificultades. Es posible que tengamos más limitaciones para llevar adelante algún número de dosieres en el pleno, pero como comisión y con la dirección excelente de María Arena, esta comisión trabaja, trabaja en la agenda complicada, trabaja sin ninguna limitación y trabaja con una agenda endemoniada, de la que muchos de vosotros habéis sido conscientes porque, porque os hemos, porque os hemos eh, eh, llamado. Eh, y sobre las urgencias. Las urgencias tienen esos problemas que decía Silvén. Son utilizadas, desgraciadamente, voy a decirlo con todas las letras, por los grupos de la derecha para apuntalar agendas políticas, de tal manera que ha sido una obsesión hablar de Cuba y de Venezuela, y no había manera de meter otras cosas, porque había que hablar de Cuba y de Venezuela constantemente, y ahora se habla de Nicaragua porque la izquierda no tiene ningún problema en criticar duramente a Nicaragua, pero no puede ser que las urgencias sean ese intercambio político. Desgraciadamente, esta es una institución política y las cosas se van por mayoría, y nosotros, Isabel lo sabe, que ha sido también coordinadora, como yo, de, de, de esta comisión, eh, bueno, lleva, hemos llevado muchos asuntos, pero al final tocaba Venezuela y tocaba Cuba, y cuando no tocaba Cuba, tocaba Venezuela, eh, y era complicado salir de ahí, y hemos quejado y hemos intentado negociar con los grupos de derecha y alguna cosa hemos conseguido. Cuando conseguimos que algo entre en agenda, también hay que tener en cuenta que esta es una institución política y, por tanto, el, el draft final… Lo primero, crece mucho porque hay que incorporar para tener un acuerdo 
en muchas enmiendas y en muchas partes del texto, eh, y eso hay que, y hay que entenderlo también, y también porque los grupos son muy cuidadosos de que en algunos dosieres no se critique, por ejemplo, a Estados Unidos o a Israel. Entonces, eh, ahí encontramos una dificultad grande y a veces tenemos que votar y votamos separadamente y no pasa nada. Cuando nadie tiene unos grandes intereses ideológicos en el país, ha sucedido hace 15 días, Haití no ha habido ningún problema. Hemos lanzado un mensaje de preocupación por Haití, de la situación horrible del país, y hemos conseguido un acuerdo en pocas horas y se ha hecho un buen documento. ¿Por qué era Haití? Porque Haití no tiene gas, ni tiene petróleo, ni hay nadie particularmente interesado en esa zona geográfica pero desde el punto de vista geopolítico, pero es desgraciadamente, desgraciadamente así. Las urgencias se han querido poner, se han querido poner los miércoles por la noche, en un momento de poca visibilidad. Y tenemos una batalla grande para que las urgencias no acaben al final del pleno de los miércoles porque les dará muy poca visibilidad. Intentamos convencer a muchos colegas de que estas cosas son seguidas por el país al que les toca y tienen un interés para la eh, sociedad civil de esos países y se recogen en redes sociales y se pueden recoger en la prensa eh, para el día siguiente. Y, por tanto, si las enterramos al final de los miércoles, estará perdiendo capacidad de llegar. Y este grupo se ha resistido siempre a esa nueva planificación por la cual las, las eh, urgencias quedarían siempre al final del, al final del viernes. Nosotros hacemos follow-up de todas las urgencias. Todas las urgencias tienen luego un seguimiento en esta comisión y en ese seguimiento le pedimos al Consejo y a la Comisión que nos digan qué han hecho en los dosieres que nosotros aprobamos. No siempre tenemos un gran éxito, pero a veces sí. Sobre la relevancia, yo me he encontrado con alguna gratísima sorpresa. Pasamos aquí tantas horas, debatimos tanto y la sensación de que no llegamos es tan obvia que a veces es dolorosa. Yo estaba hace poco en Kazajistán y se me, acordó, se me acercó una señora y me dijo, he venido, he hecho 2.000 kilómetros desde una ciudad para venir a dar las gracias, porque gracias a una resolución de hace un año y medio del Parlamento Europeo, eh, yo fui eh, sacada de la cárcel. Bueno, eso te da una, una satisfacción como las que tenéis todos cuando conseguís en vuestras labores que algo, que algo se consiga. Eh, pero tenemos que ser prudentes. Algunos países... Las urgencias son importantes para la clase política y recibimos presiones y recibimos embajadas y la embajada quiere venir a hablar y este tipo de cosas. En otros ya no. Yo trabajo con Turquía, como sabe Silvén. Turquía ya le da igual lo que digamos. Turquía le da igual, no tiene ninguna relevancia, no sale en la prensa, nadie te llama para hacer un seguimiento de una uh, declaración dura. Bueno, lo han absorbido porque hay una gran capacidad también de presión en la opinión pública por los medios progubernamentales. Pero estos son los instrumentos que tenemos para jugar, en los que necesitamos vuestra ayuda. Y ahí también voy a una cosa que ha dicho Gisela. Os agradecemos todos los papeles que mandáis cuando hay una urgencia. Eh, muchas de vuestras organizaciones mandan cosas. Tampoco se trata de que las redactéis vosotros, porque a veces recibimos cinco folios articulados de cómo debemos decirlo. Yo creo que nos viene muy bien algún enfoque, alguna información que tengáis por vuestras ramas en los países con los que vamos a tratar, eh, alguna, algún enfoque que no sea obvio eh, y, sobre todo, si sois capaces de, en vez de que recibamos, eh, que sé, 10 o 12 sugerencias, si hubiera tiempo, que yo sé que no lo hay, que recibiéramos un set de, oye, por favor, estos 10 asuntos o estos 10 enfoques, no los olvidéis, nos viene muy bien, os lo agradecemos y os pedimos que lo, que lo sigáis haciendo, como podáis, si no hay fórmula de poneros de acuerdo, nos mandáis lo que tengáis, pero... De verdad, tampoco empleéis una persona un día entero para redactar articuladamente cinco folios, no es necesario. Decidnos qué asuntos, qué enfoques, qué casos particulares creéis que se pueden, que se pueden citar. Eh, muchas gracias por vuestra presencia. Estamos en la misma trinchera, eh, esta comisión y vosotros en esta batalla por sostener el, el edificio de la universalidad de los derechos humanos y, por tanto, nos seguiremos viendo en muchas batallas. Aquí nos tenéis a la comisión, con más o menos acceso uh, a nosotros y a los, uh, a los funcionarios que trabajan con nosotros, pero siempre con la voluntad política, y quiero resaltar el papel de María Arena, siempre con la voluntad política de ser molestos, y lo somos. Muchas gracias. Tenemos un café eh, para vosotros aquí.
para tomar un café y comentar si, si queréis cualquier cosa. Muchas gracias. Y gracias a los invitados.